I'm Jared Callahan, and uh, this is a video abstract for our recent manuscript introducing a data-driven method to identify dominant balance relations from in physical systems. And I'll talk about what that means and go through one of the main examples from our paper. Uh, but I'll also just say that um, there's a lot more detail in the paper, and we also have uh, Jupyter Notebooks up on GitHub to uh, reproduce all the results, and those links will be in the video notes as well. But the main idea is that uh, in many complex systems, local regions can be well described by just a few terms of the full governing equations. And this is something that we've known intuitively for a long time and have used a variety of mathematical techniques to derive. Uh, but these usually rely on asymptotic limiting conditions. For instance, such and such parameter is much less than one or much greater than one or something like that. So what we're proposing is a method to augment the classical approach uh, using experimental or numerical data and uh, apply this perspective on physical systems to uh, more general conditions. So uh, this quote from Einstein is kind of a favorite among people who do modeling, and I think it kind of gets to the core of Occam's razor or the Pareto front or however you like to think about these things. Our models of the physical world should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And of course, one of Einstein's uh, great contributions was the theory of general relativity, which first told us that Newtonian gravity was not the full picture. But I think it's sort of telling that more than 50 years after we knew that, we landed on the moon and did it without accounting for relativistic effects. We didn't need to. Newton's law was simpler, and it worked for what we needed. And it really wasn't until we started doing things like GPS that we had to start accounting for Einstein's theory. Uh, more recently, dramatic improvements in experimental and numerical methods have given us unprecedented access to high fidelity data sets describing extremely complex physics, from protein folding to ocean circulation and even into the Earth's magnetic core. But although we have a detailed physical understanding of many of these systems, in a lot of cases we also know that the full first principles governing equations aren't necessary throughout the entire domain. Often, the local observed behavior can be described by a balance between just a couple of dominant processes. So this is the heuristic that we call dominant balance, and in some ways it's been a cornerstone of the way that we think about modeling physical systems. Classically, we do this with something like an asymptotic scaling analysis. Um, Although as the systems and conditions that we study become increasingly complex, uh, it's not always easy to do this with pen and paper. And if we can, it's not necessarily obvious where we, the thing that we derive is even going to be valid. So our goal was to develop a method that can use data to extend this approach to non-asymptotic regimes. We'd like to learn what the important dynamics are in some region uh, and also equivalently learn what we can ignore. So to make this a little more concrete, uh, let's walk through one of the examples from the paper. So this is a canonical fluid dynamics problem called uh, turbulent boundary layer. And if you haven't seen much fluid dynamics or boundary layer theory, I'll go through kind of the classic approach in a separate video. But basically a boundary layer is a region of a flow near a wall uh, where shear stresses lead to sharp velocity gradients and things like viscosity become much more important. Understanding boundary layer theory turns out to be very important in a wide range of applications, including skin friction drag on airplane wings and uh, heat transfer in atmospheric reentry vehicles. Uh, and by the way, what I'm showing here is a video uh, of a boundary layer in transition to turbulence um, from the Johns Hopkins Turbulence Database. And this is also the data set that we use in the paper. So uh, because the this configuration is so important. Uh, boundary layer theory was one of the great triumphs of 20th century fluid dynamics. And we actually know quite a bit about the physics of this flow, including uh, asymptotic behavior, dominant balance regimes, and various scaling laws. So although turbulence is famously unsteady and chaotic, um, in a lot of cases, we're really only interested in average quantities. So uh, if we take the instantaneous flow field and decompose it into uh, mean and fluctuating terms, we get what's called the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. And what I'm showing here is the momentum equation for the downstream x component. And so the way I wrote it here, we have six terms, including mean flow advection, uh, pressure gradient, viscosity, and these um, Reynolds stresses, which are related to turbulent momentum transport. 
But although we know from first principles, in this case momentum conservation, that all of these terms have to be in the equation, we also know that they're not all equally important everywhere. And I'll walk through our analysis on this case, but in the end we'll find that we can reproduce the uh, standard results that you'd get from a scaling analysis. So in this case, we can actually visualize the dominant balance pretty easily by just plotting uh, the value of the terms um, across the domain. So this is the uh, streamwise component of mean flow advection. And now the instantaneous fields have been averaged in time and in the spanwise direction, which is homogeneous. So we can repeat this for the other five terms in the equation, and we can immediately see that although most of these terms are important somewhere in the field, uh, they're not all important everywhere, and usually um, the local description uh, involves a balance between just a couple of terms. So for instance, in a lot of the turbulent part of the layer, this wall normal Reynolds stress is pretty significant, but it's balanced out pretty evenly by the mean flow advection. And then there's this thin viscous layer near the wall uh, which is also balanced by the Reynolds stress. And so these are well-known uh, regions of the turbulent boundary layer that are usually called the inertial and viscous sublayers. We could also think about visualizing this by taking each point in the discretized domain and doing a six-dimensional scatter plot, where each of the terms in the governing equation corresponds to one of the coordinates. And so uh, we'll call this the equation space representation of the field. And notice that uh, dominant balance is a very natural geometric interpretation in this space. So if we had a perfect balance between viscosity and Reynolds stress in the viscous sublayer, uh, we'd see that all of the points from the viscous sublayer fall on a perfect line between those two, and all the other coordinates would be zero. In general, dominant balance is going to show up in the equation space as an approximate local restriction to some subspace of the, in this case, six-dimensional equation space. And it might be worth pausing here a second to think about this because this is really the core of what we're doing in this paper. This geometric perspective on dominant balance is what lets us use very simple machine learning tools to identify the dominant local physics throughout the domain. So now that we have our uh, equation space representation of the field, we can think about using unsupervised learning methods to look for sets of points with variance in distinct directions. So we could imagine using any number of algorithms to do this, but we just choose some simple ones that are available off the shelf from something like scikit-learn. And I'm gonna totally skip over the details of how this works, but again, it's all in the paper and the code that's available online. Basically, the idea is we're looking for clusters of points that are approximately restricted to some subspace. And then we can interpret the active directions of that subspace as the active terms in that cluster. So uh, I wanna make the point here that um, this method is kind of intrinsically interpretable because this equation space representation is fundamentally linked to the governing equation. So any analysis that we do in this space has a clear interpretation in terms of the underlying physics and we can go through and think about what each of these balance relations actually means. So for the boundary layer, now we have our clusters and our balance relations, and uh, then we can take each point in the equation space and just map back to the original domain. And I'll also say here that we don't do anything to enforce that these points are actually near each other uh, in the original domain, although if you think about how this works and um, for a smooth field, it sort of makes sense that they would be. But now we can actually go through and uh, look at what each of these balance relations are in terms of a well-known boundary layer physics. So now we can see the laminar inflow, the inertial and viscous sublayers, and so on. So for instance, this is kind of just a standard sketch of the breakdown of a turbulent transitional boundary layer. But now we can actually start from data and see where exactly each of these things are valid. We can also check that the segmentation of our domain is consistent with known boundary layer scaling. So for instance, the inertial sublayer is known to scale, uh, the, the width of this thing is, is known to scale with x to the four fifths. And if we just take the post-transitional uh, y coordinate here and fit it to a power law, we get x to the 0.81, which is pretty nice agreement. 
Okay, but again, so far all we've done here is relearn something that we've been able to do by hand for about 100 years. So in order for this to be interesting, we need to be able to apply it to systems where the asymptotics aren't so clear cut. So in the paper, we look at a wide range of physical examples. For instance, we look at uh, optical pulse propagation in a certain kind of fiber optic cable, and we find that most of the field can be described pretty well by uh, linear dispersion relations except for this very energetic uh, soliton that needs a nonlinear Schrodinger type dominant balance. We also look at uh, reanalysis data for the surface currents in the Gulf of Mexico, and we identify regions of approximate geostrophic balance, including uh, the southern end of the uh, Gulf Stream here. And finally, we look at a generalized Hodgkin-Huxley type model of an intrinsically bursting neuron. And this one is a little bit different because it's an ordinary differential equation that's basically on a multi-scale limit cycle. But we are able to identify dominant balance relations that are consistent with the known biophysics of spiking neurons. So we have this slow background process driven by calcium currents. But then during the uh, bursts of spikes, the dynamics are dominated by the kind of standard sodium-potassium mechanisms that Hodgkin and Huxley described. So in all these systems, we're able to uh, identify dominant balance regimes that are consistent with either the standard asymptotic results or uh, our qualitative understanding of the physics. And again, the key idea here is the uh, equation space representation. This geometric perspective on dominant balance uh, lets us use very simple off-the-shelf machine learning methods to identify the dominant local physics. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge our uh, supporters and everyone who worked on the open um, data sets and tools that we use to do this analysis. And again, there's much more detail available in the links, including the classic analysis, um, details on the method, including hyperparameter tuning, uh, uncertainty analysis for assignment to a balance relation, and Jupyter Notebooks to reproduce all of the results here. So uh, thanks for checking this out, and I hope this turns out to be useful for you.